Um, we are happy to have our beach lecture today. Brian is going to tell us about central charges and monotonicity, a status report. All right, great. Can you guys hear me? Is the mic on? Yeah, awesome. So uh, it's an honor to be getting sunburned in front of you all today. Uh, there, I lost the map. So I'm going to talk, like Kumar said, about uh, central charges and monotonicity, a status report. But I should make a quick caveat that I'm just going to stick to even dimensions uh, here today. We had a, a few beautiful talks last week about three and five dimensions. So I'm going to essentially stick mostly to four dimensions, with a starting out with a quick review in two dimensions spend most of the talk talking about four-dimensional conformal field theories, and then at the very end talk about six and, and higher even dimensions as well. So that's the status in particular that I'm going to be uh, talking about. So the, the central question that uh, motivates all everything I'm going to say today is something we actually had a beach lecture about last year by uh, Igor Klebanov, which is how do you count degrees of freedom in a quantum field theory. But of course, the only interesting case is a strongly coupled quantum field theory. And most of what we, we know about this, we actually, we tend to proceed in analogy with, with two dimensions. So just to, to warm everybody up, let me get started by reviewing what's known about uh, central charges and monotonicity in two dimensions, which is basically everything. But uh, at least this way, we'll, we'll all be on the, on the same page. So we know that uh, in 2D, the thing that we think counts degrees of freedom is the central charge the thing that counts degrees of freedom is the central charge C, which, as you all know, shows up in the vial anomaly. So if we look at the expectation value of the trace of the stress tensor, we take our CFT and we put it on a non-flat background. In addition to the curvature, there's some coefficient that shows up, and that's the central charge. And this shows up in various other places as well. All of, which you, all of which you know. But of course, the nice thing about two dimensions, apart from this reproducing some of the nice weakly coupled counting that you'd want, it's one for a free, real free scalar, two for a, uh, one half for a free fermion, is that this thing is known to be monotonic. But one of the more interesting questions is exactly how strong a statement can you make about it being monotonic? So there, there are different levels of, of strength. So uh, C is, there are levels, let's call it levels of monotonicity. And in every case I'm going to talk about, I'm going to assume we start with some CFT in the ultraviolet, deform the theory somehow, break the conformal symmetry, flow to the infrared. And the question is, what can we say about C here versus C here? So the, the weakest form, is just that I have a central charge here at this CFT, and I have a central charge here at this CFT. And the general intuition, of course, is that if C is counting, whenever I say degrees of freedom, of course, I mean massless degrees of freedom, is that there should be fewer massless degrees of freedom down here in the IR. So the central charge C in the infrared should always be less than the central charge in the ultraviolet. So the weakest thing you could possibly say is that CUV is greater than CRR. In other, words, in other words, I'm not talking about any function along the flow or anything like that. I'm just comparing the central charges at the two endpoints. But there's a stronger version, which is natural, which is to say not only can I define the central charge here and here, but I can actually construct a function that interpolates between those, those two points, equals the central charge at the endpoints, and is monotonic. So uh, the stronger version is that there exists some function C, which is a function of the energy scale mu, such that, OK, let me define renormalization group time T 
t equals minus log mu, so it goes from minus infinity to infinity. As you go along the flow, you start at mu equals infinity and you go all the way down to mu equals zero. That this thing is monotonic, dc dt, which if you like, I could rewrite, let's do partial derivatives. This is also functions of the coupling, which are themselves functions of the scale. dc, d, here are my couplings, g, which I'll take to be indexed by some capital I, and then d, g, i, d, minus log mu. This is, of course, just the negative, the beta function of that particular coupling. So let's call it beta i. That this thing is monotonically decreasing, except at the stationary point. And at the stationary point, the claim is it should agree with whatever the central charge of the conformal field theory is. Okay? So moreover, and this is still a continuation of this stronger thing as well, that C at the fixed point, G star, is C of the appropriate CFT. Okay, so that's, that's an even stronger version. And that's good. This tells us we have a function all along the flow. But the strongest version, we'll see if these guys just keep doing this. Uh, the strongest version is is that I can actually rewrite this beta function in, in a nice way that I can consider this gradient flow where this beta function i is related to the derivative of the central charge with some positive definite metric g i j. And of course, if this is true, then you can see Straightforwardly, if I just plug in for the beta function here, I get minus gij dci dg, which if this is positive de definite, makes this function monotonic. So this is the strongest form of, of, of a possible level of monotonicity. And what's nice about the case in two dimensions, so what I'm saying is, is, is pretty general to to, to anything as long as I have some candidate function here. But what's nice about two dimensions is that all of these things have been shown to be true. So Zamologikov, as I'm sure everybody here knows, so I'm not going to try to spell that. Zamologikov in, uh, in 86 showed that generally the stronger form of this monotonicity is true. So stronger is a big check. And also by using conformal perturbation theory that near a CFT, it's also the strongest form of monotonicity as well, is true as well. So strongest, that is to say, gradient flow, this is true near a CFT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's why I'm just saying in, in conformal perturbation theory, this is, is this is true. Right, but that doesn't show up in conformal perturbation theory, right? I thought at some at some higher order, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that that's true. So that's all I mean here is that leading order in conformal. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, so maybe this is uh, not a super strong check mark here, but at least in leading order in conformal perturbation theory, this looks like gradient flow. And that's what's known in, in, in two dimensions. Now, the, the natural question, of course, is well, what about, about higher dimensions? In two dimensions, at least in many examples, we can compute this thing, check it in lots of examples. When you go to four dimensions and you start having more complicated, strongly coupled CFTs, it becomes a problem 
not only proving these theorems, but even computing what this, what the, what this thing, what this thing is, and what a candidate function should be. So, what's the situation in higher dimensions? So, in higher dimensions, the first thing you want to do is. is write down what the vial anomaly could look like. That's the first thing you want to ask if you want to take this analogy with two dimensions seriously. And it turns out that it looks like the, the following, is that you have, of course, in, uh, in higher dimensions, we have more curvature terms that, that we can form. And so there's all sorts of stuff here that you can write down. But it, it's convenient to break it up into parts which are vial invariant and which are not vial invariant. And the most general thing we can write down up to stuff that can be removed with uh, local counter terms is we have some sum on, let's call that little i. So this is for general even dimensions. Again, everything I'm saying is just even dimensions. Some set of functions which are constructed out of curvatures which are vial invariant. And there's some number of these depending on which dimension you're in. In four, there's only one, but as you go up uh, in dimensions, you get more. And then there's the part that is not vial invariant, which ends up being the Euler density. So there are a number of coefficients here, C, and then just one coefficient here, A. And this is true in, in arbitrary even dimensions. So Cardi conjectured just for four dimensions, but let's phrase it as a conjecture for more general dimensions, that, you know, in principle, you could ask which of these uh, is the monotonic function. It, of course, it doesn't have to be just one of them. In principle, it could be some linear combination of these. You know, maybe it's 4a times 3c1 plus 9c2 or whatever it is, right? In principle, nothing about two dimensions tells you what combination of these should be the right monotonic function. But, uh, Cardi in 88 conjectured that in four dimensions, that if you take this, of course, if you integrate the expectation value over some conformally flat background, the only thing that's going to survive is A. And the guess is that this is the right monotonic function. Of course, he just talked about this in four dimensions, but the general conjecture is that this is what should be in, in arbitrary even dimensions. That's right. So this would be S6 or S8 or, or whatever. It's just something that survives when uh, these guys vanish because the background is conformally flat. Of course, this matches in two dimensions because in two dimensions there's only one thing, which is just R, which is the natural. That's right. That's an A type. So there's an unfortunate nomenclatural issue, which is that in two dimensions it's C, but in higher dimensions it's A. Okay. So yeah, so I'll, I mean, it doesn't matter how you single this out. I just, it's the coefficient of this, this term over here. So you could single that out in any, in any way you want. And in fact, once you've written this thing down, you've already singled it out as the coefficient of the Euler density. So, uh, Although Cardi just phrased this as a conjecture and gave some evidence for it, I think maybe someone older than myself here can tell me how long this thing has been referred to as the A theorem, the conjecture that A is monotonic. Does anyone know when that actually started being called the A theorem, despite it not being a theorem until about a year ago? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna get to that, that's right. Uh, so I don't know when this started. So immediately this was a theorem without a proof. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Another great example, although somehow less important. <laughs> Only less important because I didn't work on it. So immediately people started calling this conjecture the A theorem, which survived a lot of non-trivial counterexamples. So, of course, the first question, as I've mentioned uh, several times, is 
how do you actually compute this thing? In a strongly coupled 4D theory, that's a, a, a big challenge to, to compute. And so at various times, people came up with what looked like counterexamples, but, and there, there are two examples that I can, that I can think of offhand. I don't know if this was really phrased as a counterexample, but in a paper of Dan Friedman's, they're looking at super QCD with an extra adjoint matter field, and they said, oh, it actually looks like this violates the A theorem. But then later on it was shown that the CFT they were talking about didn't exist uh, in the range of parameters that they wanted it to. So there's some conformal window, and they were looking at the theory outside the conformal window. Uh, and then moreover, just uh, more recently, I think in 2009, let's say, somewhere around there, uh, Al Shapiro and Yuji Tachikawa came up with a counterexample to this in n equals two dimensions, but uh, due to uh, an error in the uh, in the analysis of the of, of the uh, of the CFT, not theirs, relying on a previous paper, that was later discovered and corrected, and then that counterexample went away as well. So despite a lot of you know the bullet almost hitting the the heart, uh, in every known case, this theorem has survive non-trivial checks. So uh, what I want to talk about today, oh, I should say also there was a, a claim of a proof. No one ever mentions this, I guess, because it's uh, hard to say people are wrong. Uh, but I feel that it, for historical reasons, it's important to say that there was a claim of a proof by Forte and Latore. in 98, and I'm not going to say that this proof is wrong, I'll just say that nobody seems to really understand it. <laughs> uh, the, the problem in, in four dimensions, again this is just in four dimensions I'm talking about, is regulating the, uh, the two-point function of two stress tensors where you get divergences that you need to deal with, and they have some complicated spectral techniques that they use in order to, to regulate those divergences in some way that I think it's safe to say, uh, certainly it's more than safe to say I don't understand, but uh, no one I've talked to really seems to understand what's going on with this paper. Nevertheless, I feel it's important to mention it uh, because there was a claim of this, uh, of a proof of the A theorem many, many years ago. Uh, I talked to, this is even more embarrassing, yeah, one of them. I don't know which one. Uh, he was, one of these guys was at Benasque a few years ago and we talked about, I, I think it's kind of a sensitive thing, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, right. The, the, uh, I'm, I'm not saying anything controversial, just that there is something out there I don't understand. So, that, every, I think everyone here can believe that. Um, right, so maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but it is safe to say that it is not widely accepted as a proof of, of, of the A theorem. So I shift the blame to you rather than me. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the, the question then becomes how do you actually prove it? And this was an open question until, so this has now been proved by Komergatsky and Schwimmer. Last year. Okay, so now we've gotten to the outline of my talk which is I just want to tell you three things. So here's, this, this was all purely motivation. So the, the status report part of it is in four dimensions this is proved. We'll talk about higher dimensions in, in a little bit. So here, here's the outline of what I want to say. First I want to talk a little bit about, because I think this is an interesting question, is how do you compute A. It always looks like it's missing a word, but it is not. <laughs> it, there are a number of, well, we can talk about jokes later. Um, so how do you actually compute the central charge A, or for that matter, any of the other central charges? And you could put C or C, which is less interesting, but Nevertheless, maybe something you want to compute to actually check monotonicity. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and then I'm going to review the proof of these guys. So just wanted, this is a, a beautiful proof. Uh, 
So I'm just not going to go into a, a crazy amount of detail, but I do want to go over it to give you the, the basic idea. And then at the very end, I'm just going to end by talking about d equals 6 and higher. And I have to say, most of what I'm going to say here, this is based on a paper of Henrietta Elvang and collaborators. Okay. And then I'll lump some conclusions in. In there. So before I continue and move on to the, the first part of this, are there any questions or comments? Relativistic, unitary, Lorentz invariant. That that yeah. So in two dimensions, uh, we're normalizable. Uh, in two dimensions, those are the uh, uh, those are those are the assumptions. In as we'll see in four dimensions, it, it's essentially the same thing. Not necessary. No, you don't need a Lagrangian description for, for this proof. That's important. So the only Lagrangian we'll need is for, the, the crucial part of this proof is going to be finding an action for the dilaton, which shows up when you spontaneously break conformal invariance. And that will actually be able to write an action down for. But as far as the rest of the CFT, who cares? It, it, it's not relevant for the proof. Yeah, Daria. I just want to make sure that you, nothing goes crazy as you go back up to the, as you go from the UV, for example. It's not a problem when you go to Yeah, that's, that's fair. It's, it's a very subtle thing about how they actually analyze the, the, the IR of that N equals 2 theory. So I, I, rather than derail the conversation right now, uh, I, I, I won't go into it. But it's a... I, it was a non-trivial mistake. Uh, I forget the authors, but that's probably good for diplomacy uh, that some, some previous authors made in analyzing that theory. But I, uh, the details are just are quite subtle. OK, great. So let's start with part one. How do you compute A? So the, the first thing I feel compelled to do is actually, of course, this is only interesting in uh, a strongly coupled theory. But just for the purposes of seeing some numbers, I want to write down what the answer is for A and, what A and C values you get for free theories. So if you have some number of scalars or vectors or fermions or whatever, uh, what numbers do you get? And part of this is just to so you, you see them in case you've never seen them. But the other part is to show you that it's not quite as simple as it is in two dimensions. So we're not going to get one and a half. We're going to get some weird ass stuff. OK. So uh, maybe I'll do this up here. So for free theories, let's just do that first. And let's make a table of A. And C, these are not meant to be deep. These are just some, some cool numbers. So let's say we've got a real C. C is the central, is the coefficient, sorry, in four dimensions, in four dimensions, the uh, trace of the stress tensor looks like C times a vial tensor squared. I think maybe it's minus A times the Euler density. Okay? So I'm talking about the coefficient of this term in the uh, in the vial anomaly. It, it's the, just the leading term in the, so when you write down the, it, it is the, the coefficient of the two-point function of the stress tensor. No, it, that, it's still true that it's the two-point function. Yeah. Okay. So let's say we have a Meyer on a fermion, massless vector. And then because it'll be useful later, let's talk a little bit about supersymmetry. n equals 1 vector versus n equals 1 chiral multiplets. OK, so here are the numbers. Uh, I want to write these down as fractions to emphasize how unnaturally weird they are. So 2 over 720, of course, 11 over 720. 
124, and then for vectors you get 9 48ths and 1 48 for A, all right? And then for C, 1 over 120, 3 over 120. I'm not simplifying these just so you can see the relative amounts more easily. Uh, and then 3 24ths and 1 24. Okay, so right away, the, the purpose of, of writing these down is just so you can see the numbers, but also so you can see that counting degrees of freedom is going to be a little bit weirder in four dimensions than it is in two dimensions. It's not just one and a half, it's all these crazy numbers. So as I think a question Simeon asked uh, during Igor's talk, what do we mean by degrees of freedom? This is, if I have some number of free scalars, fermions, and vectors, this is some weighted sum of, uh, of those numbers of degrees of freedom, but weighted in a weird way. Certainly, I don't know any, I would love to know this if anyone knows, an intuitive explanation for even the relative uh, values of these numbers. I have no simple explanation for what it is other than you just write down the Lagrangian for the free thing and then compute the stress tensor and there you go. It does. So I'm actually going to, uh, yeah, yeah. So if you take the, uh, the vector and the fermion, does that just naturally work out? Yeah, it works out. I would claim I just did that in my head, but uh, I didn't. It works out. Of course, for, for the chiral, you need a complex scalar, so you, know, you want to double that. But yeah, so if you're bored right now, check it. Uh, it, it, it does, in fact, work. OK, so uh, as I keep saying, for interacting theories, it's more challenging to compute these numbers. And in fact, if you're just at some strongly coupled CFD, generally, you don't know what to do. So uh, let's specialize to the case where we do know what to do. So let's go to supersymmetry. And this is not for any reason other than hopefully we have some tools here to compute what these numbers are. I keep dropping the service. OK. So uh, in supersymmetry, there's a nice, uh, Actually, a rather beautiful result due to Anselmi, Friedman, Grissaro, and Johansson from 97, who showed that these two central charges are related to a tuft anomalies of the, of the R symmetry. So I won't go through the, the details of the calculation, although I will motivate it in just a minute. So it turns out that in terms of traces of the R symmetry, A is 3 over 32 times 3 trace R cubed minus trace R, and C is 1 over 32 times 9 trace R cubed minus 5 trace R. And uh, just to, to tell you briefly, okay, so first of all, what do I mean by trace R? I mean sum over all the R charges of the fermions in the theory, so we're doing a like a triangle diagram here with a, an R current and two uh, gravitons. So for example, trace R, by this I mean sum over all the chiral fermions, their R charges, and then the dimensions of whatever representation they happen to be in. Right? And similarly for R cubed, then you just cubed, cubed that guy. OK, so that's what that, uh, these tuft anomalies mean. So to, to just the, the calculation of, of getting this exactly right with the coefficients is, is rather detailed and done beautifully in an appendix in this paper. But just so you can see where this is coming from, uh, this is coming from essentially the fact that the R current and the stress tensor are in the same multiplet. So all I'm assuming here is, by the way, n equals 1. I don't need more than that. So uh, a sketch of where this comes from, and it's going to be super sketchy, is that so the trace of the stress tensor looks like C times some vial stuff squared plus A times some Euler density. Let me, as usual, not write down what exactly those functions are. But similarly, if I were to write down the divergence of the R current, so let's call that the, the R current mu is, R with a mu is the R current. I'd expect something like this. I put the theory in some non-flat background. So I'll put it in a non-flat R background as well as a non-flat gravity background. 
I'd expect something like trace r cubed times ff dual for the r background plus trace r. There's, there are too many r's, which is a problem. But uh, so Riemann, Riemann dual, say something like this. Right, so here's the triangle diagram with three r currents and then r gravity, gravity. And the point is that supersymmetry relates these guys. So if I just sort of naturally supersymmetrize these things, by the time I get up to the part in the multiple where I have t mu mu, I'm going to rejigger these guys into some linear combination that then shows up in front of the appropriate curvature terms. Okay, so that's the one minute summary of why you'd expect some relation between the cubic and linear Tuft anomalies and the central charges A and C. Obviously, there's a lot of details that go into getting this exactly right, but these results check out. So in fact, to do a quick check, so that you can see this isn't insanity, let's just do a, a free chiral superfield, which I'll call phi, which has R charge two thirds. So just to, to do this, so I want the R charge of the fermion, which is minus a third. And indeed, if you just plug into this formula, let's see, three times minus the third cubed, minus minus a third. This thing is, what is that? That's uh, minus a ninth plus a third. That's two ninths, which indeed reproduces, hopefully, yes. Uh, 1 over 48, which is the number you expect. So, okay. I, I think these are independent of that. So, okay, so I, I mean, this was nothing that people couldn't have done for themselves, but it's nice to see algebra. Uh, all right, so the point of this is that as long as you know the R symmetry, you can actually compute this thing. And in fact, in many theories, we know precisely what the R symmetry is. It's fixed by, this needs to be not just an, an R symmetry, but an anomaly free R symmetry, right? The superconformal algebra requires that there's an anomaly free U1R for n equals one. It's in the same multiplet as the, as the stress tensor. So if you can fix that R symmetry through making sure that it's, uh, it doesn't have any gauge anomalies, and also whatever symmetries you have between the uh, various matter representations in your theory, you can often just compute this guy and then it's no problem. So one nice example. So here I, I'm doing this example for a reason, not just to, let me switch markers here. Because it's going to go somewhere that I think is worth seeing at least once. So let's say we have SUNC Super QCD. Right. Yes. Yeah, so I, we have some questions. Actually. Please. Uh, this point, like, you know, this, this, there are different R terms we can define as we talked about. Uh, one which fits in the multiple process, right? So the stress tensor. Mm -hmm. One which obeys the ABJM, uh, the ABJ theorem. Oh, yeah, so I'm specifically talking about the one that sits in the right. trace yeah, with the then, stress tensor. You are using ABJ. I don't understand the question. I mean, this is just the one loop anomaly, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just saying that these quantities are defined by the one loop at Tuft anomalies. That's all I'm saying. So I don't care if they're one loop exact. Yeah. That's why I asked about the renormalization. It's a statement. It's not a statement depending on renormalization. No, that cannot be true. The trace anomaly is proportional to the renormalization. The trace anomaly gets higher with correction. And this, this, this R current also gets higher with correction. Yeah. This, this is a, it's a different definition.
Yeah, but it's worth emphasizing, though, that these are the, uh, you know, these are going to give, for example, anomalous dimensions, which are not holomorphic quantities, right? These are the exact, related to the exact, you know, non-holomorphic uh, scaling dimensions of theories. Okay, so uh, as an example, let's just do super QCD. The R anomaly, which is essentially related to what we we're just talking about. Um, so if I look at the the R current with two gauge bosons, I want that to be anomaly free. So I just sum over the Casimirs and then the R charges. So I have some gauge enos here, which have Casimir of the adjoint. And then some number of flavors. I have Qs and Q tildes, so there's two NF. Casimir are the fundamental. And then R charge of the chiral superfield minus one for the fermion. Of course, we know what these are here. This is just NC. That's a half NF RQ minus one equals zero. So a computation probably many of you have done. The R charge of uh, of the Qs and Q tildes, which are the same by charge conjugation, is just 1 minus NC over NF. And I write this down for a reason, not to just do more algebra, but to say that you can use this to actually show the simplest example where, at least the simplest example I know, where C is not monotonically decreasing. So a nice example, which is, it's sort of hidden in the literature, which is why I wanted to, to make sure to mention it right now, is if you consider this in the bank Zach's limit. So let's say we have NF equals 3 NC, Take large n, so let's just uh, have some little. Uh, let's let's have this be just below the asymptotic freedom bound. So NF equals three nc minus epsilon. If you look in this limit and you flow from the free UV theory, this is asymptotically free. The UV is free. The IR is a weakly coupled CFT, right? A bank Zach's point. You can actually show in this case, and uh, I wrote this down just so you can check it with this again if you're feeling bored. So you can actually check in this case that CUV minus CIR goes like minus epsilon to leading order. And then there's some higher order stuff as well. So I think this is a nice case where you actually see that uh, C increases in the, in the infrared. This, this example is hiding in a paper. Uh, it's one of these papers by some subset of these authors. I think this letter keeps getting swapped out in a series of these papers. There's an AEFJ. There might be two e AEFJs. Anyway, uh, Josh Ehrlich uh, replaced Grissario on some of these papers. And hiding in these papers are this great example. But there's something even better that you can see if you start playing around at the various ends of the conformal window and the various bank Zach's limits, which is that, moreover, if you look, for example, at the magnetic, at the, the uh, magnetic asymptotic freedom bound, so just above the bottom of the conformal window, by, uh, by comparing the two limits, what these guys show in one of these papers is that, so you can again play with, play with R charges there, so no linear combination of A and C except A can be monotonically decreasing. And this really just comes from doing examples. And the reason is that in the, at least in the, in actually both these, uh, well, I should say in the magnetic limit, the contribution from C completely dwarfs the contribution from A. So what A is doesn't matter. And then you can rule out anything that possibly is going on with C. So the only thing that could actually be the monotonic function in four dimensions, the only remaining candidate, just because of this very simple set of examples, right, SQCD uh, at, the two bank Zach's points is just A. So I think this is another fact that maybe uh, is not as widely known as it should be, that in this simple example, you can just see that straight away. So I won't go through the details of the computation because it's, it's easy to work out. OK. Um, the only other thing I, I want to say here, so what does this have to do with monotonicity? How am I doing on time? Okay, great. 
I'm halfway through. Does that work out? Oh, yeah, the food's not even out. Okay, great. Halfway through is good. That's all I wanted to hear. Uh, so the question that you might ask is, okay, so this, these are, this is an example where you have a uniquely defined R symmetry fixed by symmetries and, uh, and anomaly freedom, gauge anomaly freedom. But uh, what if the R symmetry is not unique? So in principle, there might be flavor symmetries, which I'll call Fi. So let's just say you have some extra U1 global symmetries in the picture that might naively mix with, let's call it a candidate R symmetry R0. So that means there's some trial R symmetry, which is a guess for the R symmetry, which is some combination of your initial guess. Let's say that does everything you want. It's anomaly free, super potential is R charge 2, all the usual crap plus some linear combination with real coefficients, of course, over all the other, uh, all the other U1s. And you might say, okay, well, that's fine. You know, you can have lots of R symmetries. But of course, that's not true when the theory is conformal. There should be a unique R symmetry that's in the same multiplet as the, as the stress tensor. So uh, how you figure out which one, you find the super conformal R symmetry by a, a, a result of mine and Ken and Trilligators in O3, which is that you take the central charge A that when the theory is conformal, so looks like, let's just take the expression we had before but put trials in front of everything, or as subscripts, I mean. I left off traces, but whatever. There are traces here. This is now a function of all those parameters SI. And you just, this is some nice cubic function. You maximize it. So maximize, hey, sorry. Here? Yeah. Why, why wouldn't they be? Yeah, this is just, I'm just adding charges together. Yeah, I'm just adding charges. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about the proof of this. I'll just wait for this guy to drive by. No, we won't. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the proof of why this is true, except to say that there is some, obviously this is a cubic function, so it doesn't have a global maximum. There's always one unique local maximum. You go to that point at some point in the space of these coefficients. That ends up being the superconformal R symmetry. So the, uh, the, what I mean by that is when you plug those numbers in, of course, you get the set of R charges that give you the numbers that show up in your superconformal R current. Local maximum. These are always a local maximum. There's no global maximum because it's a cubic function. But there's only one local maximum. Yeah, because if there were two, you could draw a line between them and you'd get something that wiggled too many times to be a cubic function. So the, the reason that I'm saying this is because it initially, back when, when we found this in 03, we were pretty psyched because it seemed like this is just a, a little bit away from a proof of the A theorem. So let, let me prove the A theorem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So I have nothing to say about non-supersymmetric theories uh, for the rest of this section of the talk. Assuming this maximization you are I'm going to uh, assume this is true, which it is, and then uh, use it to, to prove the A theorem. No, I'm not going to explain why this is true right now, just to avoid sort of de derailing the, the talk. I can talk about that later. Yeah, so we prove, oh, this is just, ends, it ends up being equivalent to a statement about correlation functions in a CFT, which you can repackage nicely as the maximization of, 
of this function. As far as why, if there's some deep reason why it's this particular function that shows up, that's, uh, I don't know the answer to that. That's actually. similar to the argument of CT where you're 1.4 makes 1.4 No, no, it's, it's not quite the, it's not, it's not the same thing. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's pretty different. Second derivative of this is a linear? Yeah, it's like the two-point function of two flavor symmetries. So if I take two derivatives of this with respect to two flavor symmetries, I'm going to get something that looks like R flavor flavor. You can show that that's actually related to the two-point function of the two flavor symmetries, which has definite sign. So therefore, this thing has to have some definite sign. Yeah. So it comes up with a negative coefficient. Therefore, it's a maximum. Yeah. So I, I, there's something like C extremization in two dimensions. So I know this is something, uh, so I have some unpublished stuff uh, on this, and some guys here also, uh, Francesco and Nikolai, are, are working on it as well. There's definitely something like C extremization, except there C is a, uh, a quadratic function rather than a cubic function, right? So as you go up in N for two N dimensions, the degree here changes by one for every n. So you're solving some bunch of linear equations, but I, I don't know if, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't have to be any maximum. So there's something like C extremization should work. One thing actually we tried to do, one of the reasons this paper on that never came out, is that we couldn't find good examples where this was actually an interesting question. So if anyone here, I'll, I'll phrase this, uh, as an open question. If you know, for example, a 0, 2 model in two dimensions where there's some ambiguity in the R symmetry and you want something like an extremization principle, I mean, it could be anything as long as it has a U on R, uh, and you want something like an extremization principle and have a way of checking it, I would love to know such examples. But every model we considered was either trivial or so baroque that we had no way of checking it. So maybe there's, I'm sure there's some experts on 0, 2. Where's Jock? Is Jock here? Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, Jock's not here. Um, that's right. I'm sure he just stepped away. He wouldn't miss my talk. Um, so uh, if you know any 0, 2 models where you think there's some ambiguity, talk to me after because we're looking for co-authors. They have something on products of Riemann surfaces, I think. So uh, yeah, they, I think they're looking at theories where they take the M5 brain on products of Riemann surfaces. Uh, and there, 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 there's some ambiguity related to the different twists they can do. OK, so let me prove the A theorem for you using this idea of maximization. So uh, let's say you take the theory and you deform it by, so deform your theory by a relevant operator. Well, this is going to break some global symmetries. And then you're going to maximize, if you find the new uh, central charge, if you do A maximization again in the bottom, you're going to maximize over a subset of your original parameters. But maximizing over a subset means that you're going to go down. So therefore, A U V is greater than A I R. OK, A theorem proved not. So uh, there are two steps with this proof. And coincidentally, this proof has precisely two incorrect statements in it. One is, is this, of course, it's not generally true that you're going to break some global symmetries. For example, you might have, so this is wrong, because how can you say, for example, there's no accidental symmetries that show up in the IR? A, a, a maximization requires that you know all your global symmetries. If something shows up in the IR for whatever reason that you couldn't control in the UV, you can't make that statement. And of course, Maximizing over a subset only decreases if you're going from one global maximum to another global maximum. If you have a local maximum, how do you know you just didn't get unlucky when you started out and you started at a low, low, low 
a low local maximum. And then when you decrease your parameter space, now suddenly you're going up a hill. So this, because it's only a local maximum. Okay. So uh, I think in our paper we call this an almost proof, which is a content-free statement. Which? If the A theorem is true, can you prove this? Well, this, this is can, certainly the, the proof of the A theorem that we know right now has nothing to say about no, this no, one way or the other. It's just a separate statement. Yeah. Okay, so uh, how do you fix this up? So I, I want to talk about one proposal that uses this idea to, to kind of patch up this proof of the A theorem, uh, which is not patched. I should say there's a reason you haven't heard about this as a proof of the A theorem, which is because it doesn't work for precisely the reasons that I described here. But there is an interesting proposal that I mentioned because I'll bring it back again at the end. So there's a proposal by Kutasov. later in 03. So of these statements, the accidental symmetries thing, you know, if you say, hey, I've understood accidental symmetries, basically you've solved strongly coupled quantum field theory. So there's not much hope for making progress here except in special cases. So in fact, people do understand the case where there's a special family of accidental symmetries that come from operators hitting the unitarity bound, uh, r equals two thirds or dimension equals one. In those cases, we can actually say something about them, but as far as a general statement about what are the possible accidental symmetries? This is still wildly out of our control. So even in the case of n equals one supersymmetry, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but uh, Kudasov had a proposal that appears to, at least in a lot of cases, deal with this problem of saying you're never gonna go up the hill. So his idea is that you take your central charge, which is now a function of a central charge A, which is now a function of all the R charges and some uh, Lagrange multiplier I'm gonna put in, which looks like this, so let's leave off our 3, 30 seconds, because it doesn't matter. So this is 3, trace, let's let these R charges be completely free for the moment, but then also add in something that, let's take a simple case where I have no super potentials or anything like that, I just have a single gauge coupling corresponds to the numerator of the NSVZ beta function, which starts out non-zero, Right in the UV, the theory is, is asymptotically free. So this thing starts out non-zero. This is proportional to the NSVZ beta function, just the anomaly in the uh, R symmetry. But then in the, when it hits a, a, a conformal point in the infrared, this thing should, should vanish. Okay? So the idea here is what you would normally do in A-maximization is you would extremize with respect to this Lagrange multiplier, solve your constraint, and then maximize over the remaining free parameters. Kutasov's proposal is to flip that on its head and go the other way and say, no, 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 extremize first with respect to these various R symmetries Ri. So solve dA dRi equals zero, which gives you R charges as a function of this Lagrange multiplier, and then also, of course, the central charge A as a function of this Lagrange multiplier. And then this is something which is a candidate for an A function all along the flow. So uh, lambda goes from zero in the UV to some lambda star, which you can show at least in examples is positive in the IR. And now it's easy to see that this is monotonic. So dA d lambda is dA d lambda plus this guy. I just solved those, but as you can see from here, this thing is just automatically, uh, automatically decreasing. No, it's just the numerator. So I'm assuming that, for example, sorry, let me let you finish your question. Doesn't that assume the unitarity relation in writing the 
the, the, uh, yeah, so I'm just assuming I have an anomaly free R current, and I'm also assuming stuff like I'm not hitting a pole in the beta function where things go to hell. So there's, this is a perennial problem, right? How do you rewrite zero in lots of non-trivial ways? But this is just the, this is certainly fine in the, I mean, in a weakly coupled theory in the far UV, this is just what you can show by direct computation. Doesn't matter. This is just a, a thing that's going from something that is non-zero, something that is zero to, I'm oh, sorry, something that is non-zero to something that is zero. Surely this is positive in the UV, and this is zero in the IR. Well, that's going to be true in the in the IR, right? Because that, that's the de that's the definition of when we hit a not the definition, but that's a consequence of when we hit a CFT. Because if you want the trace, of the, the trace of the stress tensor to vanish, then you're going to have the R anomaly vanish as well. In some sense, the, the, also, you shouldn't take this super seriously. This is a very ad hoc proposal. So you can't derive this from anywhere. This is just a guess for a function along the flow. So the question then becomes, is this a good guess? So uh, I only say it because it is a, a proposal that, as far as I know, there are no counterexamples to this being a monotonic function Along the, along the flow. And indeed, this is just the case where there's a gauge coupling. If there are super potential couplings, you can write dimension minus 3 here and get similar types of arguments. You can go to town on, on this. And in every known case, this argument appears to work. I should say also that to leading order, these lambdas are supposed to be related to uh, couplings in the theory. So for example, on the gauge coupling, you can show just by computing these R charges as a function of lambda, and then also computing them uh, as expansions in, in G, that lambda to leading order goes like the gauge coupling squared plus blah, 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 blah. So the idea is that somehow these are tracing out trajectories in coupling space. But this is not a proof of the A theorem either. So there are problems. One is accidental symmetries again. Uh, the other problem that this doesn't address at all is something that the kudasov schwimmer proof addresses beautifully, which is what happens if you move out on moduli space and, for example, Higgs the theory. Here I've talked about deforming, you know, here just I have some gauge coupling that's flowing to be interacting, or I have, I could put in a super potential deformation here, but if I move out on moduli space and say Higgs the theory, I don't know how to use this technique to show that the central charge always decreases. So there's actually a problem which I'll just call Higgsing. I don't know if anyone has said Higgs at this conference yet, but it seems appropriate. Um, so the other thing is, if you move out on moduli space, this proof, th th this idea doesn't address that at all. OK, so uh, that concludes part one. Yes. Sorry, say, oh, no, 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 this is not zero. So now these are totally free parameters here. So in, in regular vanilla A maximization, then you would just, this doesn't exist. This, ex, this is a constraint. And this thing is maximized by itself. This is a different proposal. This says that now you have free parameters all along here. And so when you set this thing equal to zero, you're going to get contributions from this part of the function as well. So it's no longer true that the derivative of that thing with respect to R equals zero. Now, at the end of the day, when you hit the place where this thing vanishes and lambda hits its fixed point, then you get the superconformal R charges. So in other words, R of lambda star, wherever that is, would be the superconformal R charges. And that's like an equivalent way of saying that is you've just solved whatever constraints you have here, NSVZ beta function vanishes, or the superpotential is marginal. And then if you still have some free parameters left over, some free R charges, then you could maximize and you would get it something that's equivalent, you would get exactly what we have before. So in the way that we were doing A maximization, we solve every possible constraint you could have. Here that's implemented via extremizing with respect to the Lagrange multiplier. And then if you have some free R charges left over, extremize with respect to those. But here everything is free initially. There are no constraints. Uh, there are just Lagrange multipliers. Okay, great. So let me move on now to uh, 
the more interesting part of the talk, and I'm not too far away from the end. So let me just summarize by saying in, in n equals one theories, we still don't know a proof of the A theorem. So the, this idea of maximizing a function is suggestive, and it's useful for computing the R symmetry, which you might need for computing dimensions of uh, chiral primaries and stuff. But it doesn't actually get you, even though it seems initially promising, closer to a proof of the A theorem. But I did want to talk about this uh, proposal of Kutasov because it seems correct. You know, it, it is a candidate function that, as far as we know, is monotonic. So one open question that I'll again come back to, or at least mention again at the end, is, is this proposal of Kutasov somehow related to the monotonic function that Komargatsky and Schwimmer uh, describe? Okay. So any other comments or questions before I move on to part two? Yes. The, well, so I mean, it, it does imply that these shouldn't be problems. So I think it would be interesting to work through the details of that, but I don't know how to, uh, how could you, so, okay, so it should be, it should be true, but I, I don't see a direct line between how to take their proposal and just plug it into to this. I, I would imagine you might be able to, but uh, somehow that would just be encapsulating all the effects of, for example, accidental symmetries in some fairly mysterious way. So I don't, you know, I don't know if you would be able to actually say anything about what those things are. You would just say, oh, the function you get at the end of the day is going to be monotonic. It's a very bizarre situation that yeah, but the, the techniques they use don't, you know, don't directly tell us anything about the things we want to... Is it raining? Ah, uh, compute. Okay, that's a bad sign. Okay, yeah. Okay, so before their proof gets rained out, uh, let's go through it. So let me just sketch the the Komergatsky schwimmer proof, which is really a, a beautiful and remarkable idea. So the, uh, let me just say what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, the, the basic idea here, so all the money is going to be made in the following way. You take some CFT, and then we're going to spontaneously break it somehow. So if we take a CFT, spontaneously break, ooh, that's a nice marker. Well, briefly it was a nice marker. I got overly confident. Should, I was going to say, can we move? There's no real way of moving these inside, is there? In any way that people can. Can I move one right here? It's raining now? It's. Yeah. It's, it's dropping. Yeah, it Just push the people in the back out. Great. Yeah. I think this is okay. I, I can stick to this one board too. I don't need to go over there also. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you, man. Um, okay. So, let's talk about this Komergatsky uh, Schwimmer proof. And this is from last, I think it's basically a year ago. I think it's, uh, is that right? July? Yes. Yes. Essentially one year. Um, so, the, the idea is we're going to spontaneously break conformal invariance. Which leads to a dilettante, which is the goldstone. Let me, let me get to, to this. Uh, uh, the case I'm going to focus on mostly is where that is actually true, where you move out on moduli space. When you, the other thing you can do is introduce a relevant, relevant operator and then put in the dilettante and some kind of compensator. I would rather just give the, the simpler idea here and then we can argue about 
the more complicated one in a moment. But yes, in general, certainly, really what I'm talking about here is I have some, you know, moduli space, I'm at the origin, and then I move to some other point, and that's going to Higgs the theory or do whatever, and then spontaneously break the, uh, the CFT. Of course, an interesting case, which I was talking about before, is deforming by a relevant operator, which is not spontaneous breaking, but they cover that as well. We can get to that later. Well, let's say, so, um, so you have some dilaton that then shows up as a goldstone. And then what they do is they write down. Right, but this is where, this is where I'm going. So I'm going to write down, I have some, some action I can write down for the dilaton. No, yeah, I'm just saying there's a, there's a CFT, and when I spontaneously break conformal invariance, there'll be some Goldstone mode, right? Correspond, Correspond to the broken. If you talk about, for example, a gravity theory, covered the small part of the there's always metrics and deformations of the metric. And so sure, so sure, sure. There will be Dilaton in that theory. But we're not talking about covering this gravity theory, we're talking about small theory. So what does it mean exactly? When you do but I'm just talking about a. I don't quite understand the question. So I, br I, break a, I break a symmetry, right? I'm going to get some massless goldstone. If you had a top of the CFT, yes. If it, it wasn't part of the CFT, theory, no. If you want to know the modulation, then by goldstone theorem, you have a mass closed on her. That's right. You're saying this is part of the dynamics of the theory? That's that right. So this, this just comes out once I break the. So I'm not saying I couple it in initially, although that is, in fact, what you need to do the case that Simeon was asking about. Right. But let's ignore that for the moment. Let's say I just have a regular old quantum field theory and not, uh, not coupling it to gravity. So or, for example, right. in 2D theories, this would be a different dilaton than the one we are familiar with? Yeah, this, that's part of, the, then I'm coupling it to some kind of gravity. Here I'm not doing that. I'm actually breaking the conformal symmetry. I'm just saying you get some Goldstone mode, and that's what the dilaton I'm talking about is. Right, as soon as I have a broken symmetry, I'm going to have some Goldstone mode corresponding to that broken symmetry. I'm just thinking about the analog of that in 2D. What's the analog? Right. Exactly. So what, so there's not. So the, this, proof, this proof doesn't work. I thought in, that their proof had actually an analog in 2D. But that's, I think that's no, what not, Igor was explaining it. Too. Not in any way I understand. Right. That's right. But moving out on moduli space, as right. people say, no spontaneous proof. Mm -hmm. Fair okay, so I just have this dilaton that, uh, that pops up, should have some action that I can write down and have some self-interaction, some kinetic term, blah, blah, blah. The kinetic term's a little weird, but whatever. Um, and then the money that they make in this proof is to notice that there's a particular term that shows up in the dilaton ac action whose sign is constrained, and they can actually use that and then forward scattering of the dilaton. So there's some nice term. So there's a nice, and I'll write all the details down. I'm just kind of going through the basic idea. Nice term with coefficient A. Well, let me not draw an arrow. And then the simplest, if you want just the weakest form of the A theorem, this term is one of these four derivative terms that was famously uh, in a paper of Arkani Hamid et al required to have definite sign. And they say you need, okay, if you just want, uh, re really the coefficient is delta A, it's the difference between the central charges of the UV and the IR. If you just want the weak form of the A theorem, you can just look at that term and say that has to have a definite sign by just general, uh, uh, general reasons. In their case, they don't want superluminal modes. Uh, so you can just say whose term, uh, I want to say which, has definite sign. Now, this doesn't address the slightly stronger form of the A, func a, a theorem, which is to construct a monotonic function. To do that, we'll go through the details of that in, in just a second. But they also address that. But what's nice is that this weaker form of the A theorem just kind of pops out 
automatically. Okay, so that's the, that's the structure of the argument. Spontaneously breaking informal symmetry, you've got some dilaton that's going to pop up. Write down its possible actions, and then look at the term you can get, one of which, has, the nice one, has coefficient, which is the difference between the central charges and the UV and the IR. That's the whole idea of, uh, of the proof. Which is nice. I mean, th this is not requiring, I should again emphasize, haven't said anything about supersymmetry. Haven't said anything about you know, fancy, fancy stuff that I need to actually compute A in various examples. This is just a general statement about 4D CFTs. Okay, so uh, what's the dilaton action? I'll call it tau, which looks like a two, I guess. Well, this is an interesting uh, question, and it's a, a calculation that's not uh, that's not too bad. You can you can do it. There are two parts of the action, at least in principle. There's a part that's invariant under diff times while uh, transformations and a part that's not. So, so there are two parts. Diff cross while invariant or not. It turns out that the not part is going to be interesting and the diff cross while invariant, at least to leading order and what we care about, is just going to give us the kinetic term. So, the invariant action for the dilaton is just this. Not too hard to show. There's some dimensionful constant which is related to the VEV of how you're breaking the CFT. And then if you just write down, so you write down, this is basically root GR, but where G has compensated for by an appropriate dilaton factor to make the whole thing diff times violent invariant. So if you write down root GR, you get e to the minus 2 tau d tau squared. And then there's some dimensionful number here. Obviously, this is dimensionless, right? So you need some dimensionful number here, which is related to the VEV of how you broke the conformal symmetry. And just if you crank out the e equations of motion on this, wow, because this is nice just to see, you get box tau equals d tau squared, just so you can see what the equation of motion is. Okay. Now the variant part, the part that's, uh, What's sorry, What's f is a some dimensional number which is related to the VEV of however you broke the, uh, uh, the CFT. Okay, so the variant part, what you want, you can say, okay, what's the variant part? Well, I know what answer I should get. If I do a, a vial transformation, the answer I should get should be the conformal anomaly, right? So if I do some, uh, if tau goes to tau plus sigma, so I do so I, I shift this by some sigma, and then I look at the, uh, the variation of the part of the action that changes, I should just get C times the vial stuff plus A times the Euler stuff, right? So I have that, and then C vial plus A Euler. So that's the answer I should get. So now the question becomes, what action do I write down as a function of tau to get this transformation correct? And you can see that because this stuff has metric in it, right? Even if I take the variation with respect to sigma, this vial part won't change, but the Euler part will change under vial transformations. So the question becomes, what action do I need to write down? Essentially, I just do it order by order and ask, what terms do I need to write down so that when everything is repackaged, I've canceled off the rest of the variation of this Euler term? It's a cute idea, right? So what's nice about this, of course, is that is vial invariant, so that doesn't change at all. It's just sigma times that thing is the vial part. The Euler part has a more complicated behavior. So if you just go to, uh, to flat space, let me write this down up here. So a lot of this stuff I'm just going to do on the equations of motion and in flat space. You could write down the thing in general, but just to save some time, let's not do it. It's, is it raining on the, oh, it's the water. Can I have one of those bags? 
Oh, oh great. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Is this wet too now? You know what? Equations have two sides. Equations, I said, but I meant erasers. Two sides for a reason. That's dry, I think. So, okay, is this going to work? <laughs> no, it is not. Aha. It was the marker that was bad. Okay, so the, uh, the variant part of the, the action, I'm just going to have to look this up and write it down. There's a lot of stuff that goes in here, but let me write down just the part that, what it looks like when I stay on the equations of motion, which I am to leading order, and go to flat space. So it turns out that the variant part of the action, the part that changes under diff times vial transformations, is 2 times the central charge A times some d tau to the fourth term. OK, so I'm vastly simplifying things here. If I'm not on the equations of motion, it looks more complicated. There's other stuff, which includes curvatures. If I just state a flat space, this is what I get out. OK? So the total dilaton action, as far as we are concerned, once we spontaneously break the CFT, it's really simple for the stuff we care about. It's this part plus that part, and that's it. OK, so here's the idea. is the idea is if I spontaneously break the conformal symmetry. Oh, perfect. That's exactly what I needed. So if you, let's say, move out of moduli space and spontaneously break the conformal symmetry, there should still be, just for uh, the reasons you uh, always expect, there should be matching between the total anomalies, the total central charges, in the UV and the IR. Now, if you get rid of the dilaton stuff, of course, the central charges will be different. But essentially, all that's telling you is that whatever is going on here should just make up for the difference in the UV to the IR. So the idea is that when you spontaneously break the conformal symmetry, uh, S, there's some, let's call it, uh, well, let's just call it the action. There's some CFT part, which is the CFT and the IR. And then there's some dilaton part, which, among other things, includes the change in the central charge times this four derivative term. Okay, so this is AUV minus AIR. And all this is saying is that the total anomaly, once I include the A from this part, added up to that, I've got to have the same A that I did in the UV. But now, this is exactly one of those terms that Nima et al. argued should have definite sign. So delta A. So for the weakest form of the A theorem, we've just got it. Delta A is possible. So they have this whole beautiful paper arguing for uh, unitarity, no superluminal modes. When you grind out the dispersion relations you get from this thing, they say that this term, precisely this kind of term, needs to have definite sign. Therefore, delta A is greater than 0. End of story. So it's the weakest form of the A theorem proven uh, Via, let's review the points, anomaly matching, right? So I got delta A here, and then uh, uh, absence of superluminal, superluminal modes in this action. OK, so now if you want to actually construct a function, I have no idea what time it is. Am I going way over? Oh, OK. Not that long, 10 minutes. Uh, so if you actually want to construct a, a, a function here, which you do, should I use the Eraser or this? I'll use this. OK, great. So the, uh, the other nice thing these guys do is they talk about, uh, so if you want to actually construct a function, there you talk about dilaton scattering. So their idea is look at the four-point scattering of dilaton. So let's say we have dilaton four-point scattering. And this, in general, is going to be some function of the, the Mandelstam variables st and u, just like you expect. And to leading order, what is this thing going to be? Well, um, let me just make sure I get all the numbers right. It's just controlled by that term that I wrote down right there. So if you actually write down uh, the leading order form of this thing, it's delta a 
You can just write it as functions of s, s squared, t squared, and u squared. Any mixed terms go away by the sum rule, right? s plus t plus u, s equals zero. And then to fix up the dimensions, you have this dimensionless, uh, dimension full, excuse me, constant. Okay? So their idea is look at forward scattering, which means t equals zero, s squared equals u squared. This is just a function of s, 2 over f to the fourth delta a s squared, but this has some nice properties, right? This is just a, a forward scattering amplitude, and we understand the analytic structure of, of this guy pretty well. So in fact, if we look at a contour in the s-plane that looks like this, let's move it away from the origin there, even though these points will actually go to the origin, there are branch cuts all along the axes. So let's look at a contour like... What, what is that? I'm, just, I'm trying to regulate. Eventually, these will go to the origin. So this is something like, you know, this would be the you know, 4m squared or something like that in standard uh, scattering. There's no m here. I'm going to take those to the origin in just a moment. So I'm just drawing this to illustrate the contour. In fact, this is going to get. This is going to get pinched. What is which quantity? This is just the scattering amplitude for. There's no, there's no quantity. These are just going to go to the origin. These are just the usual branch cuts you get in, a, in scattering amplitudes. Right? These are all the, uh, the multi-particle states. Yeah, so I'm treating, I'm just using this as a trick right now to write a nice contour. Those points don't mean anything as far as, as, far as what I'm saying. I'm going to, part of the trick here is going to be smushing those in to the origin and then arguing that nothing crazy happens. All right, there's no mass. There's no m squared here. Yeah, so I'm gonna, so what I can do here, I guess, okay, I, I'm lying a little bit. So in the, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the distance of those points to correspond to the energy scale that I'm looking at the theory at. So in the far UV, that's like taking those points all the way out to infinity. In the far IR, those points are gonna go to the origin. Okay, so the, the it's the energy scale. That's right. So it, it's essentially the renormalization group scale. But you need to check that nothing goes crazy at infinity or at the or at the origin. Okay. So look at the following function. I don't know if I'm getting wet again here. So look at this amplitude over s cubed, of course, there's an s squared here, right? I'm going to have some pole at the origin and then the discontinuity across the contour, right? So if you actually work this thing out, what you get is that delta A equals up to, let me get the factors right because that's important, f over 4 to the pi times the integral around this contour, but there's a symmetry between positive and negative, so let's just say greater than zero uh, to infinity, the discontinuity, s cubed. Okay? So where you make the money here is that now I have a natural candidate for a function all along the flow. which is just to take this contour and then move this point out, but change where, this, uh, where, where I'm doing the, the contour, right? So their function, their A function as a function of mu, the, the claim is this is the right thing to look at, is it's going to be AUV, so this is AUV minus AIR, minus this thing integrated from some scale on. ds squared, let me get that right. Does this exhibit all the momentum dependence? Yeah, so this is, there's higher order stuff that I'm not writing down. And right. is that the one that produces the cut? Because I don't see the cut. 
Sorry, isn't just this the cut that you would get from normal yeah, forward scattering? Where is that? Sorry, say what? If there's masses, but there's no. Well, the, the, these guys are. Uh, so my understanding was that the cut should still be there, but this point will go to the origin. So normally you'd expect some, some that points, that? and then go on from here. Uh, where is that? I'm not sure. Is the spacing between those two points or? Well, the, no. The, the, the location of these two points is, so in the, in the IR, they're just at zero. Right. The, the, this is, so, right. Yeah, so these, these, I mean, they should be related, I, I would think, to some kind of, to the, whatever multi-particle states I can form out of whatever massless stuff is going on in the, in the CFT. Okay, so I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you. Well, but evidently for the last line, you are using the fast so I'm I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. Comments from anybody? Okay, so I, I'm not sure. At any rate, let me just finish this and then we'll, we'll wrap up and we can talk about this uh, some more. We know from the optical theorem that this should be related to the total cross section. Right, sorry. Comment? So this is positive. If I look at if I plug this guy in over here, right, then I get sigma of the cross section over S squared. That's a manifestly positive function. So if I really take this to go from all the way out infinity down to the origin. I should get some function that's monotonically decreasing as the claim, because this thing is just now manifestly positive once I plug this guy back in there. Uh, and by uh, the, the thing we just showed, in the IR I should get AIR. In the UV this thing just should go away as long as nothing weird happens at infinity with a contour, which is something you have to check. Uh, so this should just be AUV. Okay. So the claim is that's a proof of the A theorem. This is a mon of the stronger form of the A theorem, where there's a monotonic function up to confusions about this, uh, this contour. Now, there are two things that you might worry about, which is, as I keep saying, something going on with infinity and something going on maybe at the origin when you go from large mu to small mu. These are valid concerns, and in fact, we're, uh, which I won't address right now, we're addressed in a paper of Ludi, Polchinski, Rotazzi, and also uh, in a follow-up paper by, by Zohar. So although you might wor worry that there's some kind of uh, blow up here or something going crazy at infinity, it appears not to be the case. Okay, so since I'm way, way out of time, let me just wrap up by saying what the deal is in, in higher dimensions, which I won't have time to talk about in any detail. In higher dimensions, You can do exactly the same sort of thing. So this is Elvang et al. You can try to find the effective dilaton action. And it turns out that it's not quite as simple as this thing I wrote down before. So in fact, there are two terms that you need to, that you need to include. There's now a term from the vial invariant part of the action that can contribute. So in higher D, they actually go through this argument. But the problem is that A, for, you know, just for no intuitive reason that I understand, but for A, uh, just from the calculation, turns out that delta A show up, so it shows up as the coefficient of S times T times U, which of course vanishes in the forward scattering limit. So you don't have a simple proof as you do in, in four dimensions. In six dimensions, they carefully figure out how to regulate that, but they get two different terms here. 
which have opposite sign. So in six dimensions, and in fact in higher dimensions, there's no proof. There's no counterexamples, but there's no proof. Um, and in this paper of, of L. Bang et al., they actually do a few examples. They move out on the Coulomb branch of 2-0 and, and check. Everything appears to work pretty well, but uh, they still can't rule out the possibility that the two terms they get, the, the one with the negative sign, wins out over the one with the positive sign. There are very few explicit examples. There are very few explicit examples. So they check a massive scalar, which, great, works out and then moving on the Coulomb branch of 2-0, but there are very few examples. In eight dimensions, it turns out that even the four-point, so in six dimensions, still the four-point dilaton amplitude is enough. In eight dimensions, it turns out that the four-point is not enough. You need to go to higher point amplitudes. So any of the simple or simpler uh, analyticity properties of, of four-point amplitudes are completely out the window in, in six dimensions, uh, in eight dimensions or higher. But on the other hand, here's one of the questions I want to end with. Uh, does anyone know any interacting CFTs in eight dimensions? Yeah, uh, so in interacting unitary CFTs in eight dimensions. I certainly don't know any. So, you know, although you do want something, again, the conjecture is that on general grounds, you have to have something like the, uh, this vial anomaly with a coefficient of the Euler term, and there's just one coefficient. But I don't know how to check that in any reasonable examples, because I don't know any reasonable examples. So, homework, find an interacting CFT in eight dimensions. We know it can't be supersymmetric, right? You can only... Prove it does not exist would be even better, yeah. So find or, or, or prove the non-existence of interacting CFTs in eight dimensions. We know they can't be supersymmetric, right? You can only have supersymmetric CFTs up to six dimensions. So it has to be non-supersymmetric. Already that's a problem. Uh, but... Uh, I would love to know an example or counterexample of that. The only other thing I'll, I'll say is that in four dimensions, so this appears to be rock solid. This is something we waited for for a long time. It's a beautiful paper. Also, this paper of Elvang's et al. is gorgeous. Uh, they really do a nice job of summarizing the, the komargatsky schwimmer proof and ironing out some of the details. But in higher dimensions, this is still an open question. So hopefully by next year, we'll settle it. Thanks.